step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. Welcome to the Keep Hammering Collective. I'm here with Tulsi Gabbard. How are you? Aloha. I'm great. It's been oh. a great day. Oh, man. Awesome day. Lift, run, shoot. Yes. With somebody who I look up to and admire. Oh, gosh. That's, um, I don't even know what to say to that. It's It's been uh, just fun to hang out with you, but uh, highly recommend the lift, run, shoot to anybody listening <laughs> and watching because... You know, I think I think this is something that I strive for in my own, you know, personal life is just to continue to try to challenge myself and to mm. do things that I've never done. And today I did a whole bunch of things oh. I've never done with you. So um, that was a blast. Absolute blast. You did great, too. I mean, it, it, I can't say it enough. I've told everybody we've talked to today <laughs> what a badass you are. I mean, so, so good on the mound, so good with the bow and then strong in the weight room. It's, uh, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised cause I saw you rock 50 miles also, <laughs> but I, it's, it's just, uh, it's amazing to me because you've been, a uh, people know you from politics basically yeah. and politicians by and large, aren't somebody most regular people really look up to. It's like, you kind of cuss a politician you're like, mm -hmm. why can't they? Why don't they listen to this? Why don't they do that? What, can they do this? But on the flip side, you are somebody who, yes, they know you as because of politics, but I've seen the other side of you, the human side, the working hard side. <laughs> the Laying down in the parking lot with my feet up in the air at mile 30 in Hawaii. <laughs> just the grinded outside. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, it's amazing. It's what we need as leaders. That's I think what Americans would love to have. Yeah, you know, I, um, gosh, I think I had been in Congress for a couple of years when, uh, I, I don't remember what the outlet was, but a reporter asked me, so, you know, I think it was a reporter from Hawaii, so like, hey, how's it going there in Washington? You know, are you fitting in? Mm -hmm. And I kind of stopped when they asked the question. I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever want to fit in right. here. I know, you know, where I come from. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, to to fit in in the insular bubble of Washington D.C. means you've forgotten that. Mm -hmm. It means that your priorities are not uh, where they're supposed to be, which is on serving the people who hired you uh, and and the people of this country. And and I think that's so much of what's wrong with that place is you've got a lot of people who feel more comfortable in Washington with the lobbyists and the reporters and those who live and breathe and thrive in that political bubble, but completely out of touch with what it's like to be, you know, quote unquote, real, right. like the, the real lives of just people across the country. And, and, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to, um, have never fit in there. Don't feel comfortable there. Right. Uh, and, and, thrive and in, in doing things like we were doing today. Really, it makes my heart happy. Well, mine too. Um, I, I do want to touch on that. So what do you think that means for your future? Uh, can you can you have your attitude and your approach and still, quote, climb the ladder in Washington? Yes. And the reason why is in order to be truly successful mm -hmm. in Washington, Obviously, d people have different definitions of success, but to be truly successful means we have leaders in Washington who are fulfilling their responsibility to the American people. Mm -hmm. People who don't go to Washington and feel like, oh, okay, I, I am happiest when I'm going to this ambassador, the ambassador of France or Italy or whatever, going to their house for dinner. Right. People who feel like, yes, I'm going to Washington, D.C. It is our nation's capital, and that's where I'm going to do the people's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, climbing the ladder, quote unquote, climbing the ladder mm -hmm. does, it, it should not mean, well, I'm climbing the ladder because I'm doing what Nancy Pelosi says or what Mitch McConnell says. Right. Being successful in Washington uh, with the kind of leadership that we need in this country should be defined by, are you waking up every single day excited and passionate about going and taking care of the people of this country? Right. And that, that is the whole problem right now is we just don't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have people there in both parties who are more concerned about, 
you know, what part we talked about this earlier today, what parties yeah. am I getting invited to? Am mm -hmm. I, um, you know, are the people on TV saying nice things about me? And you know, what happens? Am, am I hanging out with the cool kids in Congress? And, and, and that, that right there is the whole problem. It's, it's more like high school right. than it with is the click. with the clicks. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, it, it's insane yeah. how many immature, uh, followers we have mm -hmm. who, who've been charged with this awesome and incredible responsibility yeah. to do the people's work, but they're not, right. They're not, they're doing it. They're, they're doing what they're doing for themselves to see their name, you know, in the lights or in the headlines or on the door of, of their office. Yeah rather than um, staying focused on what they were sent there to do. And it, to me, it feels like, of course, I'm nobody. I'm just watching on TV like everybody else, but it, it feels like a lot of theatrics. Yes. It, like when I see AOC up there carrying on, doing, making some big whatever scene, is she really doing it for a reason or is it just so she goes viral? It's a good question. Yeah. Maybe it's both. Yeah. Um, there, but, but, but to your point... Uh, there is so much political theater, mm -hmm. so much. And right. and when you're sitting in the room, you can see people kind of <laughs> turn it off and on. Right. Like, oh, wait, there's a camera? Okay, go. <laughs> Hit record, throw that online, uh, which is, you know, again, what, what are their priorities? Well, they're, they're showing it. Well, and that's where I've seen you firsthand. I've seen you, your, your impact on people. I've seen you interact, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. I know your story. So just tell me about how you got started in politics, because the way I understand it is you were what young twenties yeah. and you wanted to make a difference, just like you yeah. were saying right now in your, you know, in your forties mm -hmm. and you're still with that same goal in mind, yeah. hopefully just working towards a, to have a larger impact as, as you know, you get, get appointed to another position, win another election, but what's the goal hasn't changed, right? No, not at all. And how'd that start? Uh, for me, growing up in Hawaii, it really started with kind of that conservation mindset mm -hmm. of, you know, Hawaii is a beautiful place. Um, you know, as as a as a little kid, I first learned how to swim actually in the ocean. The swimming lessons were out in, in the ocean, and you know, surfed a lot, and just really grew up appreciating nature. Mm -hmm. And um, and so as a teenager, there were different things I was involved with really around the protection of water and clean water. Okay. Um, one of them was, uh, there was, there was a, a guy who wanted to come in and build a landfill over one of our largest water aquifers on the island that I grew up on, on Oahu. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with a group that was trying to stop it because even as a teenager, I knew, Hey, this is a bad idea. Right. Cause once that water aquifer gets contaminated, whether it's in a year or 20 years, we don't have the option like other states to have water trucked in or, you know, funneled in in any other way. Once that source is gone, it's gone mm -hmm. for lifetimes. And so we start gathering signatures and, and trying to figure out how do we stop this thing, lift, lift the voices of the people up, because there was a powerful person in the Senate at the state Senate at that time who was greasing the wheels for his buddy, the landfill operator. Right. And uh, and it worked. And it worked. And it was an incredible experience for me as a teenager to see, oh, wow. So this is how we can make change. So you you helped the successful protection of, yes. of that aquifer? Yes. Okay. Um, the landfill was not ever built okay. uh, over the water aquifer. Um, I, I co-founded a nonprofit where we went and uh, I used to go and clean up trash off the beaches on the weekends. But I was so frustrated when we come back every weekend and there's more yeah, trash. Yeah. <laughs> so it just got me starting to think, you know, I think I was 16 or 17 at the time, like, how do we, how do we start to change things in a f broader sense? Mm -hmm. And I came up with a little, a fun program that we took out to elementary school kids across the state. Really just teaching them like, Hey, when you throw your, you know, soda can out the window mm -hmm. and it gets down into a storm drain, it ends out in the ocean where you like to go surfing every weekend. Like, and the kids, you know, first, second, third graders, they remember they're just sitting there watching like with bright eyes, like, Oh my gosh. And it was so cool for yeah. me to see them connect the dots to right. be like, Oh, okay. So there are consequences to my actions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that ultimately led to, um, I was 21 years old. There was an open seat in the state house. Uh, where I lived and uh, I was at a kind of a junction in my life where I I could either, you know, I was thinking about either going to school and studying political science, I didn't have my bachelor's degree at the time, mm -hmm. or I could go and offer to serve. And um, 
and do it. Mm -hmm. Don't talk about change, be the change, do right, the be change. Part of it, yeah. Exactly. And so that's, that's what drove me, uh, to first, first run for office in Hawaii. And, um, and I won that seat and never thought it would be the beginning. You know, the idea of a political career was never even, it's still, it's just like, it's a foreign concept to me. Uh, but it, it began the thing that has been the common thread throughout my life is, you know, how and where can I best be of service, be of service to God, be of service to others and how and where can I make the most impact? Right. And it has taken me into politics. It's, it has taken me out of politics. Uh, it's, it's taken me to a lot of a lot of different places. But that's the constant internal um, introspection and and prayer that I have mm -hmm. um, in in what I'm seeking to do with my life. So that 21 year old girl mm -hmm. or wo young woman, and then running for president from going from that yeah. that journey. How does that happen? How did you have the confidence, even at 21, to run for that seat as as a young woman? I mean, where did that come from? Where did that confidence and that belief and and I mean, that's a big undertaking. Yeah. Um. Other people had done it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you were. I mean, you know, like age. Age, uh, I remember as a teenager, I used to complain about age discrimination. Mm -hmm. Like, what is this ageism stuff? Like, you're right. trying to tell me I'm 15 and I can't do something because why? <laughs> tell me why. Okay. And so, um, you know, as I was 21 years old and I was going and knocking on people's doors, super shy and an introvert, it was very, very hard thing for me to do, mm -hmm. just personally, to, to summon up the courage to go and knock on a total stranger's door, right. not know who was going to be behind it, not know what they were going to say to me. What were they going to ask me? Would I be able to answer the question? Like all of these fears and things running through my head. Right. But the thing that kept me going door after door after door, I knocked on thousands of doors mm -hmm. during that campaign, um, was my sense of purpose mm -hmm. uh, and my mission. And... Never once did I think, well, I can't do this because I'm 21 or I can't do this because I don't have a bachelor's degree. I can't do this like for any number of reasons that other people probably thought why I right. shouldn't do it. And, and when people, you know, when I knocked on their door and they're like, wow, and it happened a lot. They're like, oh my gosh, you're so young. Yeah. And my answer to them was like, and <laughs> <laughs> don't you want uh, young people to go and work hard for you, bringing fresh ideas and a new perspective to the challenges that we face? Or do you want a whole bunch of people who've already lived their lives mm -hmm. and, you know, have retired and are kind of kicking back and taking it easy a little bit? Yeah. And, and so, and that was in that election, I, um, uh, it, it was a five-way primary, all five candidates, uh, all of us running for the first time and mm -hmm. all very, very different backgrounds. And, mm -hmm. I, I won the primary election and then went on to the general election. And my opponent in the general election was a, a had a private practice physician, mm -hmm. and he started passing all these brochures that had a com two like two columns, like a right. comparison sheet. You and him. Yes. Okay. And under my column, it said twenty one years old, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And then under his column, of course, he, I don't know, he went to school, where degrees, That's all it fancy said for you. Yeah. Yeah. So d discount everything you else you brought to the table and just, you were just too young, well, basically. In his mind, I didn't bring anything to the table. Right. And, uh, and so it was, it was, uh, interesting to see how voters responded. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and it, it became, you know, when I ran for Congress, I was 31 mm. and it was much of the same, uh, that's conversation. Young. Isn't that, that young? Yeah. I was, I think I was one of the youngest, if not the youngest in Congress at that time that mm -hmm. now I think we've got people there who are 25, which is great. Mm -hmm. But, um, I was just told by a lot of people like, Hey, you know, you've got so much, um, you know, opportunity, you're very talented. Why don't you run for Congress in 10 or 20 years, come back right. and try again another time. And at that time, the, my major challenger was somebody who had just run for governor. He had been the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu which is big, you know, it's yeah. over a million people. And, um, and he just, he, he discounted, uh, me as a person and saw me in the same way as that, that physician did. Like you weren't a threat probably to Well, no, his, not his, at all. Right. Not at all. And, and, you know, he was a guy who was already talking, he was already interviewing prospective staff, you know, four like months before the election. Oh he yeah. He already won. Yeah. And he was supposed to win. Everybody okay. said he was supposed to win. I mm -hmm. started out that campaign with 
3% of the voting population even knowing my name. Mm. It's That's kind of tough. a big challenge. And he name, was at 100%. All right. Name recognition in it's, politics it's is huge. Yeah. Because if people don't know who you are, why would they even think about voting for right. you? Yeah. A lot of people look at the ballot and they're like, I heard of this guy before. Exactly. And that's it. That's how they cast their vote. Exactly. So yeah, I get Which it. is a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and then five months before the election, I think I was polling at 25% mm. and he was at 65%. Still way out ahead. Still way out ahead. Um, as he was thinking that he had already won the election mm -hmm. because all of the, you know, the, the chambers of commerce and the unions and everybody who was anybody was supporting him. Uh, I was out knocking on doors, holding town halls all across the state. My district, um, that district covered basically every island in the state except for the South Shore of Oahu, pretty mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And I was telling every one of these people, I'm applying for a job from you. You get to decide who you want to send to Washington to work for you. Not any organization or political power that be or political party. Right. You get to decide. Mm -hmm. And um, people, I think people heard that message. And when election day came around, I ended up beating him by a 22% margin. Wow. That's and that's, a swing. It, it, it was huge and, and it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, but... It just shows, and I tell this story because it's so important for people to realize the power that's in our hands mm -hmm. as voters and as right. Americans, because there's so much frustration and rightly so across the country with, with leaders who are failing to lead people. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not leaders or people in positions of power and leadership right. who are not leaders at all, who are looking out for themselves and, and who, who aren't fulfilling that, that promise to us nor are they fulfilling their oath to uphold, to support and defend the Constitution. And so, you know, I was just in East Palestine uh, not that long ago in Ohio and talking to some of the folks there who feel pretty left behind yeah. and forgotten. Right. And uh, one of the last people I spoke with before I left town, I was, you know, just talking to somebody on the street corner, this guy named Rick, he pulled over and came over to say hello. He, you know, he's, he's somewhat retired. Uh, I'd spent most of his life there and he just he was so dejected and so disheartened by the lack of care mm -hmm. from those who are responsible for serving them, the people in the right. small village in Ohio. And he kind of just shrugged and he's like, well, I guess all we can do is vote. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rick, yes. Yeah. But that, that is the key. Right. If you're not happy with the way things are, this is, this is nothing to do with partisanship. Mm -hmm. If you're not happy with the way things are, the only way we change it is by voting. That's what's frustrating is our voter turnout, what is it, roughly 50, maybe roughly 60%. on average, yeah, on a good day at 60. So, so everybody complains, but only 60% of Americans vote. So I think to your point, you have to get out and vote. Yes. I mean, you think about how tight the the election, the, even the presidential elections been pretty tight, yeah. really. I mean, if you're, if you're leaving 40% of the votes on the table, you know, that'll swing any election. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a great point to make. I did. So what called you to go to Ohio? I mean, why, why were you that? Did you want to su support the people there? Did you think they were being overlooked or ignored or Why'd you make the trip to Ohio? I wanted to go and, and see for myself mm -hmm. and to hear from them uh, myself. You know, as soon as I, I heard about the the train accident and the derailment and the toxic chemical spill and then that thing they're calling a controlled release, which looked like a huge bomb going off, uh, you know, I was watching this all play out on TV and and... This was one of the reasons that I first ran for office. Right. It was kind of stirs that same feeling of the protecting the aquifer exactly. back home. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I see. Um, with people's, you know, I mean, literally as we're, we're sitting here, the people there are very concerned about their aquifer being contaminated right. because Norfolk Southern, the, the, the company that owns those trains, they their priority was on getting new tracks laid down so they could run those trains through again Gonna and they money. basically shoveled dirt and gravel over all of these toxic chemicals that had spilled just so they could lay track down and get those 
get those trains running again. Right. And that's what people there feel like. They like, well, we feel like their priority was on making money and getting those trains there more than it was the safety of the community. And so, you know, I felt really, um, heartbroken for the people there and angry Mm -hmm. at the lack of the lack of care, um, coming from our own government for them. And, uh, and I, I was in New York city doing some work there and it just got to a point where I was just like, Hey, I need to go. So you can go and you, you feel like you being there, drawing attention to it, talking to people, um, and then also you go on other talk shows and then you can talk about what you've seen there, what you've experienced. And so it gives you that perspective to hopefully get the message out that this needs attention. And try to bring their voices to the forefront. Um, and to do so, to do so in a way that, um, I've I've heard from them, you know, Mm -hmm. directly. And well, even the call we had today, I mean, he, he said that nobody really heard of, East Pal- I didn't know there was an East Palestine. A lot of people didn't. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't know that was even a place, but he said, nobody ever heard of us before now. And yeah. now, so yeah, I get that. It is. And that, that was just for, for people listening or watching, uh, going that, you know, I, I, I literally, it was five o'clock in New York and I made the decision, uh, to go and booked it, booked a flight that was leaving at seven, packed my stuff real quick, ran to the airport without, I, I didn't know anybody on the ground there personally. I didn't have anybody's phone numbers or anything. And, right. um, and it was through a couple other veterans that I was introduced to, uh, um, this veteran of the Navy, Brian. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was being texting him that night and at like four o'clock the next morning and, and he and his wife, Samantha, very uh, generously offers, Hey, yeah, come by the house. And so yeah. I went and was talking to them and, um, mentioned that I was coming here to see you after. And so yeah. he's a, uh, very, very inspired, uh, by you. So I was glad that we were able to oh, FaceTime with him earlier. Seems like a great met, guy. He, and he, he texted me after I actually didn't, um, I didn't share this with you, but I want to, I just want to read it because it is, um, you know, as we're talking about impact, Mm-hmm. This is from Brian. He says, thank you, Tulsi. This month has been hell. Meeting and hanging out with you and FaceTiming Cam lifted my spirits more than you'll ever know. I appreciate you so damn much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But it's those, you know, I mean, this is, this is coming from a guy who, um, who after he left the service, uh, ultimately got to a point where he had no purpose to live. Mm -hmm. And so he's been to those, those darkest places and, uh, you know, now he's, he's in a much better place and is finding his purpose in being able to help other people who've been or are where he was. Right. And he's starting an outdoor group, isn't he? He is. Yeah. He is. It's called at ease outdoors. And, and, uh, just so he can share his own experiences and the things that have helped him in his life with others who might be struggling, whether they're veterans or not. Right. And, you know, veterans or anybody need an outlet. Sometimes outdoors can be that, yeah. be that calming. I, I don't know. I think everybody needs to calm their mind sometimes. And we talked about that, even the shooting the bows today yes. is like, <laughs> you can't be focused on anything else other yeah. than shooting a perfect arrow. And, and that's what people need. It's almost therapeutic in a way. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, okay. So I, I understand it totally makes perfect sense why you went to Ohio and I love that. And it's, it's good back to your, you know, initial, reason for getting into politics. And I, I love that. I love that you showed up and wanted to, to see it for yourself and see if you can make a difference. So why would you think that the president of, of our United States hasn't made the trip to Ohio to, I mean, those people feel like they've been abandoned in some way or ignored in some way, or it shouldn't, if he's over in Ukraine, which seems like it's a little bit further than Ohio and spending time over there, yeah. why isn't he there to see that spill or the train derailment? I mean, the most simple, the most simple answer to that is it is, it is a symptom of the bigger problem of, of not caring. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as the president of the United States, I mean, look, president Biden promised when he was running for office. And I think even in his inauguration address promised to be a president for all Americans, Mm -hmm. people who voted for him or not. Right. And I, I heard from folks there in uh, East Palestine, Ohio. Yeah. Most of that county voted for Trump. Mm-hmm. And 
the fact that that even has to cross their mind saying, well, I wonder if he didn't come here because we didn't vote for him is a pretty sad statement in and of itself. No American, right. no American should feel that way. Right. Um, and I think it speaks to kind of a bigger, pro and it's not just President Biden. We saw the same kind of dismissive attitude in, in his Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could say well, the President of the United States is a pretty big job, being pulled in a lot of different directions. Maybe the guy who should be going out there immediately is the Secretary of Transportation. Well, you know, he didn't even say anything publicly about this situation until 10 days after it was over. And then uh, a lot of his statements were like, you know, this thing is getting a lot of attention, but, you know, there are over a thousand train derailments every year as though, you know, this isn't important. Yeah. And also, what are you doing about that? Like, that's a disturbing, alarming number. Right. And when you look at, you know, where these trains, the communities that they're running through. Yeah. You know, you have homes 50 feet away. Right. A hundred feet away yeah. on both sides of these tracks. And so I'm thinking about people at home who now are wondering like, gosh, I wonder what those trains are carrying. Yeah. I wonder if our community is going to be next. And I wonder if anybody's going to be there for us. Yeah. And how maddening it must feel to be living in those communities. And then to see our president not, not only not showing up, but instead choosing to go to another country promising another $500 million on top of the over 120 billion of our taxpayer dollars that have already been sent to that country to secure their border, to pay their pensions, to build schools mm -hmm. and to undermine our own national security by escalating this proxy war against Russia. Russia has more nuclear warheads than the United States mm. and have made very clear that they, that the use of a nuclear weapon is certainly on the table. Right. And so where, where does that, where could that potentially lead a mm -hmm. nuclear president Reagan said, um, very powerfully, a nuclear war can never be won and therefore should never be fought. Right. And it is absolute insanity that we live in a world right now where the leaders in our country and leaders in other countries are so non and and talking heads on TV. They're no so nonchalantly talking about, oh well, you know, if World War Three starts, well, this is how we would, you know, strategically approach it. Or, you know, if if a tactical nuclear weapon is used, then this would happen and that would happen, mm -hmm. as though it's like just another day, right? And not not at all being honest, frankly, with them, maybe with themselves, but certainly not with the American people mm -hmm. about what that really means. And, and how, you know, yes, there are, you know, they will have bunkers that they can operate and continue to fight, fight the war right. from, but where does that leave the rest of us? Exactly. Destroyed, yeah. like absolutely incinerated, uh, and, and destroyed. So, you know, th there, there are, we, we can talk about what's happening in East Palestine, mm -hmm. but East Palestine is unfortunately just the latest in a whole string of examples of similar examples where uh, our leadership is very quick to go and, you know, launch new regime change wars or, you know, funnel more money into the military industrial complex, mm -hmm. pushing our country deeper and deeper into debt. Meanwhile, you have people in East Palestine literally begging yeah, for help, for help yeah. begging for help. It's Wh such, it's so insulting. Why is it, why do you think that's happening? I mean, why is our focus on Ukraine and doing, what is going on there? I mean, I feel like, you know, if you, Putin, who knows what his future is, but if you back him in a corner, what does he have mm -hmm. to lose? But well, so exactly. what, what is our role over there? Why do you, I, I know what they say is, you know, world peace, I, I think is kind of the, in quotation marks. Well, they say democracy and freedom. Okay. I think th those are the taglines that they're using. That what it, do you think is happening? They have wanted to, to wage this regime change war against Putin for a long time. And this, you know, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which mm -hmm. obviously was wrong and should not have happened, gave them that excuse to to wage that war using Ukraine and the Ukrainian people um, as as their proxies. Mm -hmm. And just like so many other regime change wars of our country's past, they're being incredibly short sighted 
about what the consequences and the cost um, are and and will be. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I mean, it, it's no secret. There are reports already out that, okay, well, if Putin gets taken out by whatever means, who knows, um, the next guy who's kind of positioning himself to be the next leader of Russia uh, would be far worse from an American interest right. perspective. I mean, we've had a relationship with Putin. I mean, maybe it hasn't been perfect, but whatever. We, we've avoided a nuclear war. Right. And it makes me think of that quote, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Right. So yeah, we know what he, the ills he has and maybe his mindset, but this guy you're talking about, maybe maybe who comes in, who knows what yeah. what his goals are. Maybe his yeah. goal is to take over the earth, the world. Who yeah. knows? Yeah, it's it's true. It's, um, you know, we used to have many non-proliferation nuclear treaties mm-hmm. between the United States and Russia. Uh, you know, we had JFK who worked to, to implement some of those. We had Ronald Reagan who worked to implement some of those a Democrat and a Republican president, both of whom understood and recognized the risk the risk, mm-hmm. and how important it was for the survival of the American people in our country, but also of the world to, to prevent that um, potential of a nuclear war from, from occurring. Fast forward to where we are today, um, Putin just announced recently that he was pulling out of this the lone remaining uh, nuclear arms treaty that the United States and Russia had, uh, the New START treaty. Mm. It's and not a good sign. It is not at all a good sign. And again, people in Washington uh, are barely shrugging their shoulders. And rather than recognizing, and, and JFK gave a, a powerful speech at, I believe it was American University, um, and he talked in there about how sometimes these situations seem impossible. You know, somehow it's hard to see, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, but somehow it's it's hard to see how one could come to a negotiated agreement to find, to choose that path of peace rather than that path of war. Mm-hmm. But there is a way and there has to be a way. And that's what leadership means. That yeah. That is what we require of our leaders. And what is so what what should be maddening and heartbreaking, I think, to every American is how not only has if President Biden really cared about the people of Ukraine, he would have done everything possible to try to prevent this Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the first place. Mm -hmm. There were opportunities to at least make an effort, at least make an effort. They did not take them. And then after Putin uh, invaded Ukraine. Biden would should have done everything possible to try to bring an end to this war as quickly as possible. Worse than not doing everything he could, he and his administration actively stopped negotiations that were occurring between Russian and Ukrainian officials hmm. to try to end this war in the weeks after, in the month after. Why would he do that? Because he really didn't want the war to end. Hmm. That wasn't his goal. Mm-hmm. And this is the problem. And yeah. th- these are the questions that we should be right. we should be asking them. If, if the goal was to save Ukrainian lives mm-hmm. and to stop this war as quickly as possible, he would have done everything right. differently. Instead, it's don't negotiate, don't negotiate, telling uh, Zelensky, don't negotiate, walk away from the table. We're going to escalate. Here's, money. Here's, here's the money. Here's all the weapons. Here's right. everything else to escalate this war even and even now you know it's 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 one year later after after uh, russia invaded ukraine and we have the the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff and many others in very high ranking positions saying the only way this war ends is through a negotiated outcome right the only way and we're we're and still yet, sending more exactly, weapons exactly exactly i i it makes me nervous because russia we know they'll put as many men on the line as possible. I mean, they have a lot of, a lot of guys. It's a huge country. Yeah. A, a lot of fighters to, I guess, sacrifice for the cause. They have more than Ukraine. Yeah. Right. They, and way more. That means how many deaths are going to happen. Exactly. And for what? I, and for what? Mm-hmm. And this is the problem. And, and, you know, Biden says, well, this is about democracy and freedom. And Mitch McConnell says the same. You have Democrats and Republicans in Congress who, 
who are also guilty of the same thing that Biden is of trying to amp amp this war up and claim it's about democracy and freedom. And yet, uh, you know, some of these people are the very same people who are undermining our own democracy here at home. While they're wearing a Ukrainian flag and not an American flag. I, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty meat and potatoes. I'm pretty basic. Yeah. But I like people who, <laughs> who want to care about America first, yeah. pers- personally. But yeah, I mean, I've never understood this, our involvement over there, and plus sending the money when we have communities here at home that need it, just, right. just as we talked about in Ohio. Yeah. It's, uh, and just, just to add on to that, you know, they claim it's about democracy and freedom, mm-hmm. and yet they don't answer to the fact that uh, Zelensky had uh, banned the opposition political party uh, arrested politicians who were his political opponents, took total control, total control of the media. The media in Ukraine is now government controlled, period. That doesn't seem very... He banned uh, the second largest, I think, Orthodox church uh, in Ukraine because they have, I don't know, that some of the leadership was supportive of Russia or there are Russians or something like that. Uh, the list goes, the list goes on and on. And so, um, the thing that comes to mind when Biden is there saying, you know, this is a fight for democracy around the world. Uh, if this is how he defines democracy, well, then it makes a lot of sense when we see how they're treating us here in the the United States. Exactly. Yeah. The censorship through big tech. I mean, all of it, it's, um, very similar to what's going on over there. It sounds like, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's what's unsettling because a lot of people see the stories. They and and to your point about voting and making a difference, sometimes it feels as a voter, as an, a regular American, it feels overwhelming. Like, can we? Is this ever going to change? Yeah. Can we change this? And that's where, just you know, talking with you and just keeping that dream alive. Mm-hmm. You know that okay, we got two more years of this guy, then we get another chance (laughs) to have our vote be heard. But man, it's frustrating sometimes, you know, really, trust me, I get it. (laughs) uh, It's, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I respect, I respect what you bring to the table. I respect your fight. I respect your perspective. I want you to have that opportunity to make the difference that that you've been fighting so hard for. Um, I don't know. It's, it's exciting. The future is exciting when I think of, you know, where you could go. Um, I did want to touch on how has your military career affected or impacted your political aspirations or goals? I mean, has it, has it changed, has that changed you from when you were that 21 year old who won that seat? Um, how has that shaped you? Well, I, um, so I was, was nearing the end of, so I, I enlisted actually, I enlisted while I was serving in the state legislature okay. uh, in Hawaii. Why did you do that? And uh, driven largely by um, the terrorist attack on 9-11. Okay. And, um, you know, opening my eyes to a world far outside of Hawaii, like so many Americans, and and wanting to do my part to go after those who attacked us on mm-hmm. that day. And uh, and so for me, I, I wanted, I, I, I kind of had this call to duty in that sense, but also... Um, you know, wanted to fulfill my service to my state. So I ended up enlisting in the National Guard, Mm -hmm. uh, went went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training once our legislative session was done, Uh, came back and and that following year was campaigning for re-election when our National Guard um, brigade combat team was activated and called up for a deployment to Iraq. And this was the summer of 2004. And... um, got a call from my commander. I was in, I was in a medical unit and got a call from my commander when this notice went out saying, Hey, you know, this notice just went out and we just wanted to let you know, uh, you don't have to go, you don't have to deploy. Um, your name is not in the list cause somebody else already filled that job. And I just, uh, you know, it, it didn't take long for me to communicate to him. There's no way I'm staying back. Yeah. There's no way, there's no way I'm going to stand on that tarmac and wave goodbye to you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I withdrew from my reelection campaign and got trained in a different job that they needed somebody to fill. Uh, and then, uh, went off on, on a deployment. We were in Iraq for a little over a year and, uh, served in a medical unit where, uh, the first, the, 
the first thing I did every day, I mean, it, it changed my, it changed me. Mm-hmm. It changed my life. Um, seeing and experiencing the cost of war, uh, both from, uh, you know, the human cost, mm-hmm. uh, as well as, um, as well as the cost, the economic cost, the cost in, in treasure. Right. Um, the first, the first thing I did every single morning while I was there was go through a list, a, na- a list name by name of every injury and casualty that had occurred uh, in American forces the, the previous 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And to go through each of those names and see if we, our brigade had close to 3,000 people and looking for any of our soldiers who may have been on that list and then to make sure that they were getting the care they needed either in country to stay there and get back in the fight or um, getting them evacuated and, and eventually tracking them all the way until they got until they got home. And uh, was that your job, or is that what you were just? That was my job. Okay. Yeah, that was that was uh, the the first thing, and then obviously I would go and report to um, to my commander or to the mm-hmm. general or, or the colonel um, what the status was, what the situation was, and and just uh, every day kind of thinking through and, and, and understanding, um, their loved ones at home. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my parents, they, they didn't tell me this until I got home, but you know, like every other family, every time they saw, you know, a helicopter crash or an incident that happened, um, you know, their heart tightened up Mm -hmm. and, um, we lost, uh, it, it was it was a heavy time in the war, and our base was in what they you remember they referenced the Sunni Triangle at that mm-hmm. time. We were about forty miles north of Baghdad, and uh, experiencing that, um, it's something that's never never left me. And coming back home from that deployment, um, a lot of my friends and former colleagues assumed that I was going to okay, so you're back now. You can go run for state house. You can kind of pick up your life where you left it, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't. I couldn't, my whole perspective had changed. Um, and I wanted to find a way to be able to take those experiences that I'd had and use them constructively. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite know how or where, uh, and kind of started cold calling different people and just trying to figure it out. I ended up going and working as a legislative aide for uh, one of Hawaii's senators, uh, who was the chair of the veterans affairs committee at the time Mm -hmm. and was able to take kind of those experiences as I was coming back, uh, home to help him improve care and services, uh, for our veterans. Um, but that desire to be in a position where I could actually influence, um, the policies, you know, our foreign policy, uh, really began, uh, from, from that, that first deployment. And then you had another one too, didn't you? I did. So I worked, I worked in Washington as a legislative aide for a couple of years and then our brigade was called up again and I volunteered for that deployment. Um, and, uh, came, came back with that same, that same, uh, drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was about a couple of years later that I, uh, ran for Congress and, um, uh, sought a seat on the foreign affairs committee, mm-hmm. uh, in the armed services committee. And, and that's where I served, uh, most for most of my, my eight years uh, that I was in Congress. Wow. What a journey that's been. It has uh, been. Wh- what has, when did your... Or what is your perception on the military industrial complex? How is that? Was it different when you, from that first deployment to where it is now? Or how do you see that? I didn't, I didn't honestly, like those words probably never crossed my mind before that deployment. No, I think, well, I wasn't in, but at that time I loved watching on the TV. I loved watching us bomb Baghdad personally. Mm -hmm. It was just like, yeah, these, these guys have to pay for what they did. And so that's, I think a lot of Americans, that was, I remember a lot of pride in America at that time. Everybody had flags, Mm -hmm. you know? So I understand that that, those words weren't even said at that time. It was like, no, we're making, America is cleaning up the world's mess. That's Mm -hmm. what we do. And it's like, you know, it's what we've always done, it feels like. And, um, but I don't know if I had blinders on. I don't know if I really understood. I think we were all sold a certain narrative. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and a certain bill of goods, especially, especially around the Iraq war, Mm -hmm. you know, we sent guys into Afghanistan to go after Al Qaeda right after nine 11. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they were very, very effective, um, at that time. But then 
you know, obviously now we know a lot more than we did back then, but the, the mission changed instead of continuing to make sure that we, um, that we really took out this, this Islamist jihadist group, Al Qaeda that, that act, that planned and attacked us on nine 11. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, oh, well, weapons of mass destruction, Saddam Hussein, Iraq, and, uh, and then anyway, you know, I mean, the rest is, the rest is history. Yeah. ISIS ended up growing up out of that. And, um, but we were, we were sold a certain narrative, right. you know, at that point. And, and so when I was, when I was there, you know, speaking about the military industrial complex and those who profit off of us being in a constant state of war, I saw through, you know, KBR Halliburton, which was, you know, Dick Cheney's, um, company, yeah. they had the contract to provide every single service in our camp. I mean, every how much single money service. did they make off that? And so that's, you know, I mean, I, I had just, you know, I'd, I'd served in the state house for two years. And mm -hmm. so I had a little bit of, well, I had a lot of curiosity about what, where our taxpayer dollars yeah, were going. Yeah. And so we started, you know, I would talk to the people that they brought in to go, you know, who were cooking our food, who mm -hmm. were working in the chow hall. Uh, and they were from the Philippines, they're from Nepal, they're from Sri Lanka, all of these countries where this was their best opportunity to be able to provide for their families. Start asking them, how much do you get paid? Mm -hmm. And you know, oh, okay, I get paid $500 a month or $600 a month. It's like, wow. Mm. And you're working, you know, 12 hour days, six, six, seven days a week. And how often do you get to go home, see your family? Like, oh, I get, I get like, you know, one week every 18 months or something like that. Wow. And then I started at, you know, I started asking like the, the people in charge of contracting. It's like, what are we being charged uh, per person per meal? And I think it was something like $40 per soldier back in 2005. Wow. So if I walked in, if I walked into the chow hall, because they click everybody in, if mm -hmm. I walk into the chow hall and I quickly grab a banana and, you know, maybe like, you know, those little plastic Cheerios boxes of yeah. cereal. Yeah. That's 40 bucks. That's 40 bucks to the taxpayer. Right. And, uh, and I was, I had so many conversations like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really opened my eyes. And, and then of course you start reading articles about how much money these contractors are making and, and you see the disconnect between like, okay, well this is how much they're charging us. And this is how much they're paying to the people who are providing these services to us. Yeah. Where's the, yeah, pretty, pretty, uh, huge, huge profit margin. Yeah. And because they could get away with it. And that's the thing. Right. And this is, I mean, this is not a, a yesterday problem. Mm -hmm. When you look at the trillions of dollars that have gone unaccounted for in, in the 20 years we were at war in Afghanistan, yeah. you look at now over $120 billion that we've sent to Ukraine and somebody like Rand Paul gets excoriated simply for offering an amendment saying, Hey guys, remember all that money? that is unaccounted for or wasted in Afghanistan. Well, we had a special inspector general who has told us uh, how much money has been wasted. We should appoint one of those for all this money we're sending to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What was the response by Democrats and Republicans? Rand Paul is a Putin puppet. He loves Russia. All of these smear attacks none of them addressing the substantive legitimate point he brought up. He wants accountability. The American pat taxpayer deserves it. Yeah. And by the way, guys, DOD, you don't have a great track record mm -hmm. of, of keeping track of this money or these weapons. We know that Ukraine has been and continues to be an incredibly corrupt country. Right. Incredibly corrupt. Yeah. The New York Times One has even reported corrupt. that. Yeah. Exactly. But now that this war is the war that everybody who is in this, this warmongering establishment is supporting... You will not see those stories about how corrupt Ukraine is anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyone who dares to question the, the, the legitimacy of the purpose of this war from an American interest perspective is called every name in the book. Right. And again, just saying, hey, let's just keep track of our money. Not allowed. Mm. And that should, I mean, this is, this is what raises kind of red, should raise red flags yeah. in all of our minds. Say, well, Why? Why are you so opposed to this? Mm -hmm. How come we can't even have a conversation about it yeah. without you freaking out and, uh, and, and calling us names? I just, I just read a quote today from um, Mike Pence. You know, I think, I think he's probably going to end up running for president. Mm. But uh, he made a, a pretty disturbing comment today 
um, criticizing, basically criticizing anyone who wasn't on board with the blank check for Ukraine train saying that, uh, we only, we must only have people who believe in democracy and freedom in office. So you can't question anything. You cannot question it. Exactly. Exactly. They'll just, they'll throw you in this bucket of, oh, you're questioning democracy. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, that is, I mean, it's sickening on one hand, but what, what it leaves me wondering is for the people serving, how, how do you not become disenchanted with the goals, the mission, um, your job when you, when you wonder when, if the leaders are doing the right thing, making the right decisions, and then you're just a soldier. Yeah. How do you stay focused on your job? I mean, this is a challenge that that a lot of folks in our military are facing. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was uh, a couple of days ago, just went and had the opportunity to talk to um, a few hundred soldiers. And, you know, I, I know how fresh, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserves and, and a civil affairs officer. And I, I certainly understand, um, the frustration and, and hear a lot of it. And I, I spoke to them and reminded them about how our military remains, I think the most trusted, um, people in the country Mm -hmm. by our fellow Americans. And the reason for that is when we wear the uniform and we take that oath to serve, we're not taking that oath to a political party or particular person. That oath is to support and defend the constitution. And we must be unwavering in fulfilling that oath um, in service to the American people, in service to our country, uh, and not break that trust, not walk away, not quit. And we are at a time where our country's terribly divided, where our fundamental God-given rights and freedoms enshrined in the Constitution are now being called into question or even undermined by people in positions of power. Mm-hmm. And and so we have a responsibility to do our best to continue to, um, to reinforce that foundation and, and to lead by example of what it means to stand up for the principles that make us who we are as Americans and that make us that, that, that have, that are the foundation uh, of this country. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even as frustrating, frustrating as it can be, and as the political power shift in one direction or another, you agree or disagree with the decisions that, you know, the civilian policymakers, um, are making, I think it's incredibly important. And, and it's why I continue to serve. It's, it's incredibly important that, that our military, um, continue to be unwavering in, and grounded in in that oath to the right. constitution that we take. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, man, I know those soldiers, everybody serving, want to believe and they're doing the right thing. They're protecting freedoms that we enjoy here at home. They're doing their part. You know, if we're in another country, it's a, uh, it's hard work and it's not, nobody's getting rich no. in the military, no. you know? And I know with my son, he served, he was a ranger. He said the ranger creed. All those words are very powerful, are. very powerful. I just, it, it kind of, it breaks my heart a little bit to wonder if some of those guys are questioning, you know, being in the military when some of that stuff is frustrating or they, or they might read the news. I just want them to know that, no, you're doing the right thing. You're doing an important job and yeah. we need it yeah. and how, how valued they are. Because yeah. when I think of people who served in the military, we have a volunteer military. Yes. I mean, these are people who don't have to do this, mm-hmm. who are giving away four or five or more 20 years at some of the prime of their life yeah. to serve our country. That, that needs to be respected and celebrated. And I would love if they knew that what they were doing was, yes, it's necessary work and that, and it's the, the leaders are making good decisions. Yeah. Every one of us as Americans should want that same thing and should care about that same thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore elect and select leaders who take that responsibility seriously and who are not 
bending the knee to the military industrial complex and instead who are making those decisions about where and when our men and women deploy in the world or deploy into combat based on does this mission best serve the interests of the American people, safety, security, and freedom of the American people and of our country? That should be the lens through which they're looking and the context within uh, how they make those decisions. Um, I'm not an isolationist and I'm not a pacifist. Right. I don't advocate for us burying our head in the sand and thinking, well, if we just don't engage with anybody, then, you know, we won't, we won't have any problems. That's, that's not reality. I, I live in the real world and I recognize uh, that there are those who seek to do us harm. Mm -hmm. Our military exists to protect that, to, to protect the American people in our country from them. Uh, and we've got the greatest military in the world. Let's make sure that, that our folks are, you know, trained, equipped, and ready to go out and do the mission that we've been charged to do. Mm -hmm. For those who are politicians, um, who are abusing that commitment to service that every, every single man and woman who serves in uniform has made, um, they, they should not be in office. They should not right. be in those positions of power because they clearly don't value the lives of those who serve mm -hmm. by, by sending them on missions and going to fight wars that not only don't serve our national interest, but in so many examples actually undermine our own national security and put the American people at greater risk, uh, which, which our policymakers are doing right now as we speak. Yeah. And I, I do, I know that the military gets a lot of attention for, Oh, they're more diverse and more equality. I think people need to be reminded too. We have some beasts in our military. We are the best in the mm -hmm. world. And yeah, you might see the commercials about whatever, or, see people like want to take a shot at the military like we're you know we're not as powerful as we once were because of whatever no there's some bad asses and these guys are studs out there mm -hmm. they're great at their job men and women but we have the ultimate fighting force for sure in the world and i i don't sometimes we lose sight of that because we see some some different things or media covers things um that maybe shine a different light on that but no they're some warriors out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no question about it. Um, I think it is important to, to continue to emphasize that though, you know, I mean, what, what is the function and purpose of the military? Yeah. Um, it is to make sure we have the best fighters, the best warriors in the yeah. world. Uh, and, and those who raise their hand are committing themselves to that committing, committing their lives to that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think a lot of kind of the, um, emphasis or maybe focus in, in these other areas, whether it's on, you know, what they they call diversity, equity, inclusion, and right. what does that really mean? And how does that look? I mean, that, that's a whole other conversation we can get into, Yeah, but there's a connection between, uh, what some would say is kind of the, um, not having their priorities right, mm -hmm. uh, as far as some of the leadership, uh, of, of the DOD right now it's directly connected to the fact that they are really, really struggling in recruiting. Yeah. And you know, they're like, Oh, well, you know, kids are overweight Yeah. or, um, they don't want to sign up for a job where they could die. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's so, those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of a deeper problem. You know, those who, those who sign up to serve are doing so ultimately out of a sense of purpose. Yeah. You know, you, you go and you join the military and you know, you're, you, you are signing up to serve a purpose greater than yourself Yeah, and, and the, the deep sense of fulfillment, um, that that brings. And unfortunately it's why a lot of folks who leave the military have a hard time finding their way because they've gone from that right. place where you're serving alongside people from all parts of this country, all wearing the same uniform, all serving under, uh, you know, that, that same flag, all serving that same yeah. that same purpose. Um, I think that's that disconnect, um, between like, wait, what, what, what are we doing actually? Yeah. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that, Hey, you're having a hard time attracting talent 
yeah. um, to come and serve. There, there are some deeper problems, I think, that need to be addressed within the Department of Defense and a lot of introspection to say, what well, what are your priorities? What are you asking well, people to do? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I mean, I see it where when they are promoting this victim mentality yeah. to everybody, if you're a victim, then you're not going to sign up yeah. to for a purpose greater than yourself. Because you've already feel like you've been taken advantage of. And you're going to say, well, what are you doing for me? Right. Rather and, than saying, how can I serve? And that's, yeah. So the, the, that's one big part of the recruitment. But you see this message all the time. Like our, our press secretary right now for the White House is talking about all the diversity and inclusion and equity they have. Instead of people doing their job, like yeah. hitting these markers on, we have more whatever. <laughs> I don't even know what the measures they... Well, it's they, race and it's gender yeah. and it's sexuality and Can, it's all these okay, things. Okay, great. Can yeah. we talk about the job? Yeah. What, what are you focused Qualifications, on? Qualifications. Yeah, doing a good job. Yeah. I don't care what the person looks like or acts like or what sex they are. I want to know, can they do the job? Yeah, exactly. And so it feels like the focus there is kind of impacting downstream, which is our military, you know, and that's... And then I want to get your thoughts on this too. So... We're so interested in, in Ukraine and protecting this border and, and, and everything else. What about our border, mm -hmm. you know, our southern border mm -hmm. and how that's impacting our communities here? It feels like there hasn't been anything or much done to protect our own border of our country. What's your thoughts on that? Well, that, that's a true statement, mm -hmm. first of all. And you wonder, how is that possible? How could they be so concerned about going and protecting another country's border when they don't? they're not even hitting the basic mark uh, here at home. Right. Well, you ask them, how, and they've been asked, even by some of the mainstream media, are our borders secure? And you have the, the, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, whose job it is to secure our border, saying, with a straight face, our borders are secure. Hmm. You have the Vice President of the United States, with a straight face, saying, our borders are secure, which is the whole problem is like, what planet are you guys yeah. on? You're obviously not spending any time on the border because anyone who goes down there can see our borders are not secure. Anyone I, who goes and talks to those border border, um, you know, s security agents, mm -hmm. you you get the real story. You talk to those families who live on the border. Our borders are not secure, and so if, if you're living in some fantasy world where you really believe the borders are secure, um, then that's a huge problem. It's an equally huge problem if you are just freaking lying. They are lying. To the American people. They know. They know. I mean, I hunt down there every year, right on the border uh, in Texas, right on the border, 10 miles from the border, basically. Three years ago, you'd see maybe a couple Border Patrol rigs driving that highway. Now, last couple of years, it's nonstop. It's, they can't get enough people to, to help protect that border. And when I was hunting... I ha saw big military helicopters flying over guys sitting sitting out in the doors. It was like, I mean, it's covered up with the illegals coming over. Yeah. They can't put enough people there. They're making the pol the the state police or the sheriffs rotate uh, every three weeks down there to help protect the border because they don't have enough guys because so many illegals are coming through. So I think they know they're lying and they just think that, well... If we say this enough, that's probably most people are going to hear what we say and not hear or see the truth. Yeah, it's that it has to be that because there's nobody who's ever been there mm -hmm. or seen any footage from there would say that the border is protected. Yeah, and that's what for those communities down there. I mean, they're dealing with so much yeah. because of all those people coming through. And I'm not, you know, it's not like I don't want people to seek out a better life from another country. Sure. Just go through the proper channels. Exactly. You know, and that, that's, exactly. that's not too much just to ask. Just follow the law. And we're trying to protect borders of other countries. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's infuriating, I think, for the normal, regular Americans to know what's going on and hear the politicians say something different. Absolutely. And again, it, it, all, all of these things, and, and you, you, we could probably go down... Uh, the list of every federal agency mm -hmm. and and find similar examples of of how they're failing. Oh, ultimately, they're failing the American people. They're failing to do their job, their basic core job. I mean, the Department of Education is another one. You know, we throw we throw more and more money towards the Department of Education. Teachers are still underpaid. And yeah. if we look at outcomes, 
Um, our kids, I, I think the statistic I, I last saw was something like almost half of, of uh, high school graduates are functionally illiterate. And are we asking ourselves, how do we improve this so that, you know, our kids are, are graduating with more mm -hmm. skills and, and actually being capable and prepared right. to go out and, and just live their life in whatever way they choose? That's not what's being emphasized. Instead, we have, you know, parents actually having to fight for the right to even have a say in their kids' education. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have, um, you know, teachers who are advocating, you know, f basically a trans agenda or sexuality, you know, kindergarten, first grade kids asking them like, what is your sexuality? What is your gender right. identity? These kids are like, what? So again, it goes back to what, what are the priorities? Mm -hmm. Um, what, what is being emphasized and, you know, ultimately they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about fulfilling that responsibility to the American people. And that, that is the biggest travesty because it's not them who's paying the price for their failures. It is, it's Americans and across the country and the future generations. Yeah. So when people listen to this and when I hear you talk, I think, Oh my God, why can't we have Tulsi making decisions and to, you know, because your perspective feels like a regular Americans concerns, but you have, you know, you're smart, You've, you serve in the military, you have all this, uh, your journey's just been, uh, basically Taylor made you to be the perfect politician to represent the American people. So to anybody listening, they think, yeah, man, she's squared away. She, she's, you know, my type of person. So for your detractors, what are the arguments that they would make to try to I don't know, steer people from, from you or how, how could people, what's a negative people might say about you? You know, the, the, the thing is that a lot of the critics, um, who come after me mm -hmm. are people who are not interested in engaging in a substantive dialogue or even, or even, or even coming after me with, with substantive attacks because I see some comments. I see a couple, mm -hmm. there's a couple themes that I, I see and it feels like you've addressed them before. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if, if they, if you address what the detractors might say, how would you do that? Look at my record. Mm -hmm. Look at, um, listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying. And again, whether it's on foreign policy or domestic policy, um, I, I have been very clear um, and you know, my, a lot of the attacks that come my way are either coming from people who, uh, are choosing an attack because they're, they're not actually interested in what I'm having to say. And so, right. they, you know, they just won't pick any one of a number, um, or, or there are people who are intentionally trying to, uh, smear my character or plant seeds of doubt and credibility, um, because, they disagree with what I'm saying or feel like somehow I'm a threat to whatever, whatever it is there they care about or, or, or that they're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But if they would listen to you, then I, I, cause I see that all the time. I see like a lot of positive things like, Oh, I wish, could she run for president? Can she move to this state and be our governor? Mm -hmm. People love you. And then the tired arguments might be, well, um, the world economic forum, globalist type thing. So, um, what do you say to those people that, that want to throw out that, well, you're linked to this mm -hmm. W E F. Um, again, look, look at, uh, li listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with, with the, the W F is the world economic forum. Um, with, with that, you know, I go back to 2012 when I was first elected to Congress um, there was a lot of buzz around my election and none of it was created by me. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was brought in and there were headlines and news stories saying, Oh, you know, Tulsi Gabbard's a rising star in the democratic party. Right. You know, we'll see her in the white house one day. There's endless potential. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it was, I think, because I checked a lot of their identity politics boxes Right. and they thought that I was going to come and be like everybody else where they could, uh, tell me what to say or tell me what to do and I'll just toe the line and okay, cool. Then we'll just lift her up and kind of set it, set her up for, for success. 
uh, in, in politics in their own mind. And so some of the things that happened as a result of this narrative that they created, um, thinking I was going to allow myself to be their puppet. Right. Um, you know, I was barely in office a few weeks mm -hmm. when I got a call, for example, like, Hey, you know, will you be vice chair of the democratic national committee? Wow. I didn't seek it out. And my response to that phone call was, what does a vice chair of the DNC even do? I had, yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds important. Well, yeah. I mean, I thought, okay, well, you know, I had no idea what this was before, but maybe this is a, a an mm -hmm. opportunity where I could try to make an impact in that position. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was welcomed into the Council on Foreign Relations. I didn't know that much about it, but I thought, okay, well, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Maybe I can go and make an impact uh, there. My, my name popped up on the, the WF website as, as someone they had designated as a young global leader. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, you know, maybe this is a, a, a platform where I can go and, and um, you know, deliver my message and, and, you know, bring to the table the things that, that I care about. Right. And uh, so, you know, all these different things came my way. Mm -hmm. um, and I took advantage of opportunities to... You know, I, I ran I ran for Congress because of those experiences that I'd had in the Middle East. Right. And um, spoke out against uh, the kind of globalist policies that the World Economic Forum pushes. I spoke out against these interventionist regime change wars and talked about why mm -hmm. they are counter to the interests of the American people. Right. And um, and so like with the World Economic Forum, you know, I, I didn't I didn't get invited to go to speak at any of their events or didn't attend any of their sessions or anything like that. But um, I think it's important. It was important for me in that position to be able to take advantage of of those platforms and opportunities to be that voice in the room, maybe the only voice in the room right. saying no we the people are not here to serve your globalist corporate agenda. Right. Um, we the American people are not going to cede our sovereignty to some foreign leader or to some multinational corporation. And so, um, you know, people who attack me for these things, mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate because they haven't been paying attention. And, right. and you know, I answer them just saying, listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And you never, so you never had that opportunity to go and address No, them. no, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I was ever invited. Um, I don't think I ever was and certainly never They put attended. you on the website because you They were, put me on the website and I found that I, it was a surprise to me yeah. that I ended up on the website. But, but I think, you know, the thing is that all of these things happen because the quote unquote powers that be saw a potential for me to be one of their, one of their puppets that right. they could groom. And, and we, we've all, you know, we see these politicians yeah. in office today who, who fulfilled that purpose. Yeah. But once they realize that I'm not that person right. and that I actually think for myself and I, you know, will stand up for our country and for our security and, and stand up against the war machine uh, very quickly, they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe we don't want her in these positions. My my name and picture got taken off the World Economic Forum yeah. website. And and like I said, I wasn't invited to go and speak at these different things. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, it, it kind of speaks to the uh, how both Washington and um, kind of these globalist organizations work. Mm, right. And uh, it's something that, you know, we should be aware of. Um, but I think most importantly is take advantage of these opportunities to speak up yeah. and to expose them for, for who they are and what they're about and what their actual interests are. So and that's what I've dedicated my time to doing. You wouldn't be opposed to going there and speaking on behalf of the American people. And say, I've, I've said so many times, I will go and speak to anyone, anywhere yeah. to further the interests of the American people, our national security and peace. We have to. Otherwise, what are we going to do? We're going to sit in a room together and talk to people we only agree with and right. just hope and pray something changes and like those assholes in office are somehow magically going to leave. Right. No, right. we have to. And this is what if we're... If we're concerned about our foreign policy, if we're concerned about the direction our country is headed in, if we're concerned about how our freedoms are being undermined by those in positions of power, both in government, in the media, in big tech, what do we do? Do we remain silent? 
Right. Do we sit in a room with an echo chamber of people who only agree with us? No. Or do we find that courage and conviction in our own hearts because we really care about this country that we love and we care about the future that we're leaving behind for the kids and the generations who will come after us mm -hmm. and take that step into what can be a scary place, into a place that can open you up to attacks because we have to fight for our future. Right. We cannot think that our freedoms, that our, our constitution will remain unless we stand up, we the people stand up and fight for it, every one of us. Well, and that, that's why I respect your journey so much because I believe what you're saying. I, I believe, I don't believe when people want to th lump you in and say these negative things because I've, I've been watching. And I think part, if people do listen to what you say and they watch your actions also, you did leave the Democratic Party. I mean, that took courage because you were, I mean, I think, you know, they picked Kamala Harris over you because you would have outshown you were a stronger leader. You're better than Biden. They can't have a VP candidate being stronger and better than the president. It's not going to work. But so I understand. I mean, you were you were right there. You were in the mix. You were on the you debated for that position. You were you know, but you left it because, I mean, you, you explain why you left the Democratic Party. And why you're an independent now? Well, the Democratic Party of today is completely different from the Democratic Party I joined 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a family like some are, some have in America where, you know, you know, my great granddaddy was a Democrat and yeah. my granddaddy, you know, there was no legacy politics in my family at all. My parents were just like, hey, you like you think for yourself, you figure out, you know, um, you figure things out for yourself. And so yeah. when I was 21 and I decided to run for office and I was looking at the form, uh, you know, like which box am I going to check mm -hmm. about, you know, for which political party. And so it caused me to really think about and, and look at, you know, what do these parties stand for the democratic party and the Republican party and, and looking at the democratic party, both in Hawaii and then also, you know, the, the party of JFK, the party of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, this was a party that I saw was a big tent party that was inclusive, that was welcoming of people who might have different beliefs on different issues, but who would take a stand for, uh, for the little guy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that was the history in Hawaii. Hawaii was run by, um, wealthy Republican landowners for a long time, uh, from its annexation at becoming a territory and then becoming a state. Right. Um, up until, and, and, and a lot of these landowners were, they were treating the, the people who worked on their plantations like shit. Mm -hmm. Um, but the living conditions, the pay, I mean, just, they, they didn't have a voice. Right. And so it was the unions that came in and started to organize them because, you know, one group's tried to fight for rights on their own. And then the other group, it was just, it just wasn't working out. Right. So they finally, they all came together and they organized and they fought for basic basic rights to take care of these working people. And that's what shifted Hawaii away from being controlled by a few very, very wealthy corporate landowners uh, to Democrat um, mm -hmm. control. And it's been that way ever since. Um, but that principle of fighting for the people um, and being inclusive and fighting for civil liberties and civil rights, I mean, that was, that was the party of JFK. Right. And that was the party that I joined. You fast forward now to today and really over the last few years, we've seen this just rapid spiral downward to insanity in the policies that the Democratic Party is pushing. Right. Everything from people who don't believe that we have the right to free speech, um, people who don't believe that we have a right to defend ourselves, People who, I mean, the Democratic Party is now the war party. Right. You know, it, with this with this whole uh, proxy war against Russia and with Ukraine, there's not a single Democrat in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate that's come out in opposition or even challenging. There, there was a small group of them that came out and sent a letter to Joe Biden um, 
I don't know, towards the end of, of last year saying, Hey, you know, all these flowery, flowery, like kiss ass words in the beginning of the letter. And then mm-hmm. finally it just said, Hey, we really urge you to lead an effort towards a negotiated peace. Right. Because if this war continues, it's the Ukrainian people who will suffer, who will experience even more destruction and disaster and could even lead us to a nuclear war. They sent this letter out. It was made public. The very next day, barely 24 hours after, they retracted it because they got so much. Yes, the backlash was so strong. Mm -hmm. They chose not to take a stand uh, and literally retracted the letter and made this weak statement saying, oh, well, you know, of course they blame the staff. Oh, the staff sent the letter out or some crap. Like, like, dude, your signature was on the page. Yeah, yeah. You read, I mean, I hope you read it if you sign your name to it. Right. But ultimately their statement was something like, oh, well, you know, we, we still believe in, in uh, negotiated peace, uh, but you should do it after Russia loses. Like, how can you be a, a yeah. logically thinking adult and think that that makes sense? But, right. you know, that that is the Democratic Party of today. If you look at the Republican Party, there's, you know, a lot of warmongers in the Republican Party, just as they're on the Democratic Party. But at least in the Republican Party right now, we've got a growing number of voices mm-hmm. who are challenging the war machine in Washington, who are standing up for the American people, who are standing up for our security, right. risking being attacked and smeared because they understand what's at stake mm-hmm. and they understand where their loyalties and priorities should lie here at home. And the threat to the to what we hold near and dear. Exactly. I mean, safety of our country. Exactly. And our people. Right. Well, one thing, I mean, I respect and I, I, uh, I don't know, I can't explain how much I like your journey and how you've went from wanting to truly make a difference. And it's so different than say the Bushes or the Clintons or the Bidens, even these big political rich families. I mean, you've been grinding yeah, you've been grinding. I, we we in the in the fifty for the fallen ruck, you know, helping fallen service members, which we were both part of, and you you helped organize that. But we went by your house, mm-hmm. a normal house. It's not some big mansion, and it's just like, God, this woman works her ass off. She says what she means. She pushes back when she doesn't believe in it. She lives a, a normal life that most people could identify with and relate to. And you're out there working your ass off, making a difference. I mean, how can you not respect that? So it's, that's, that's why I look up to you so much and I want to share your message and I want people to give you a chance that maybe whatever, I don't know what they're reading or what they're hearing or what they're saying even, but I know what I see and I see a true American fighting for the American people. And I, I mean, it's, it, it gives me great honor to know that you have been in the mix and you're still fighting. And I, I think, um, the sky's the limit for you and I'm excited. I, I don't know what's your goals right now. I mean, you've done so much, but where do you hope to go? Thank you. First of all, um, I don't take your words lightly because I know they're not shared lightly. Mm-hmm. Um, Life is precious, you know, it's, um, there was a big sign at, uh, the camp where we were at when we were in Iraq and it was at the gate, um, where, uh, you know, all of our security patrols went in and out of every day. And this sign read in big block letters is today the day. Hmm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks the first time I saw it. And I saw it most days for the year that we were there. And it was that ever present reminder that any day could be our last. And that was just as true for us there as it is for us as we sit here tonight. Life is short and my goal is uh, to make the very most of the time that I've been blessed with, Um, to dedicate my life into service uh, to serving God, trying to be pleasing to God. And what better way to be pleasing to God than to be of service and work for the well-being of his children. I don't know exactly where this leads, but I do know that we are at risk of losing the country that we love. 
you know, it's becoming increasingly um, hard to recognize. And the fact that, you know, we, we can, and, and there are, there are tons of disagreements on, Oh, how do we improve the education system? How do we improve healthcare? You know, how can we fix services that are being offered to our veterans? Um, you know, what, what's the best, what are the best investments we should be making in our infrastructure, even border security? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ideas out there right. at a basic level. We have to come together and stand on the foundation of the constitution of the United States. And we have to have leaders in office who are committed to upholding the constitution and who are bringing a heart of service to the roles that we ask them to fill. We, the American people, we, the voters. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to do everything that I possibly can to, um, to be that leader to fulfill that responsibility and to offer that service uh, in exactly what role or how or where or when I don't, I don't know. And, and that, that's honestly, that's not important to me. What's important to me is, you know, how, wh where can I make the most impact and right. how can I best be of service? Man, that's, uh, I admire that. Um, that mindset is, it's giving, it's uh, of service, it, and it goes hand in hand with what, as an adult, or I guess as a teen, it sounds like, how you've uh, tried to live your life. I was curious, too, how does your faith impact this, your decisions, your daily life? Tell me about that. Uh, it's everything. <clears throat> you know, it's... it's um... You know, I, I, I draw strength and clarity and, um, courage. Um, it, it's what I pray for, mm -hmm. um, every day mm -hmm. and, and asking God every day, um, please let me be of service and, um, having faith, um, in him that even though I don't know what the outcome may be, or I, I may not know what, you know, the next, where the next 10 steps lead, but so long as I'm doing my best, um, in that mission and that goal to, to serve, I have faith that, that, uh, you know, think things will work out. Yeah. And that, that to me is, is, um, politics has become such a game to a lot of politicians. Right. You know, we, we see during election time, people talk about, you know, all the polls and the horse races and the this and the that, and you throw up the fancy board and, and it's kind of, you see a lot of those same boards on sports center, you know, and they're talking yeah. about the football yeah. fields and stats. the fantasy football and the stats right. and everything else. And, you know, they, they lose sight that this is about real people yeah and families and kids and communities whose lives are directly impacted. Right. Yes, by the decisions that our leaders make, but who who those leaders are and what they care about and mm -hmm. who they care about. Right. And so, you know, when you look, for example, at, at Palestine, Ohio, residents there told me, well, our governor has been paid off by that company. Mm -hmm. Oh, thousands, they've given thousands of dollars. They spent millions of dollars on lobbying Congress. Right. And so people aren't stupid. Politicians mm -hmm. think people are stupid and that they'll buy the lies that they're selling them. But people aren't that stupid. Right. They see the, mon the, the trail of money. They see how they are not the ones who are the priority for these people who are in power. Mm -hmm. And so I think recognizing, um, for me, drawing my strength and my happiness um, from from doing my best to be of service to God is certainly what keeps me grounded and focused because I don't care. I don't care what people on TV say about me. Right. <laughs> you know, right. I'm not trying to win any popularity contest yeah. and you know, I don't draw my validation from what people in Washington say about me or, or anything. So yeah. Um, and, and it's why like people say like, oh, how do you withstand these attacks? Yeah. Cause I, I've heard it all right. and I've gotten them all. <laughs> 
Um, and I wake up happy, um, because I, I have, I have an opportunity, uh, with my life, um, to try to serve and I'm far from perfect by, you know, I'm, I'm a highly flawed individual, but, but I, I, I know that, that so long as I continue to try to do my best, um, that, that is where my happiness comes from. It comes from within, it comes from God and, and knowing yeah. that no matter what happens, uh, his unconditional love is there for me, for every one of us. And so, you know, with God's love, like, what do I care what Nancy Pelosi thinks about me? Right. You know what I mean? Right. No. <laughs> or whoever, fill in the blank, talking head on television. Like, and that, that, that right there is the problem is so many people in Washington make their decisions based on, you know, yeah, what other people say right. about them. And, and it's just, it's just sad, really. It's sad for them. Like, man, what a shallow life you must live. Yeah. Approval ratings. Approval ratings. Yeah. But it's even more sad because of the consequences that the American people feel from those who care more about themselves than they do about the people that they're supposed to be serving. Yeah, I agree. Is a, are there politicians or people in that role that you do look up to that you do think are doing a good job? Yeah. I mean, there, there are a few people who, who I know, um, and, and who I had a chance to serve with, uh, in, in both the house and the Senate. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, well, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, if I'm looking at the people who are lining up to run for president right now, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't have confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't have confidence in their, their ability to lead us. Well, I guess you better put your name in the hat. So <laughs> can you win as an independent? Do you think? I mean, that's, that's a question really. It is a question. I, I don't, it, I don't know. It, it's not something, um, cause as crazy as it sounds, what do you need? 500 million to run a presidential election? A lot. I mean, and so without yeah. being in the DNC or the RNC, well, I mean, you, you would have to assume that the DNC or the RNC would support a candidate that they can't control. Yeah. Um, the, the reality is that, that if we want to see change, if mm -hmm. we, the American people want to see change, We've got to do something different. Mm -hmm. We have to be involved, first of all. Yes, we have to vote. Um, but we can't just play the same old games and think we're going to get uh, a different a different result. Yeah, we've been trying that. I mean, and well, a, we, we end up, right? I mean, like I, in election after election, I feel like we end up in a place where it's like, oh, what's the least worst option? Yeah, that's what. It, and that's a horrible choice to have to make. That is, <laughs> I know. In the United States of America, you know what I mean? Like how many countries around the world look, you know, they look to the United States and look up to the, the principles and values that, that, that we were founded on. Yeah. And then yet we're in a place where it's just like both sides are, are, are generating fear as the motivator saying like, well, if you, you know, this other guy or this other team is going to do all of these horrible things to you. So yeah. vote for us. Yeah. It's, it's a really, really bad place for us to be in as a people. And it's, it's, um, it's a really manipulative move on the part of those who foment fear for their own right. foment fear and divisiveness for their own political gain. That's what they've been. I mean, that was the whole thing with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it's, it's for been control. A, Look yeah. how much control they get. It's been a formula that's been working for them. So I don't see it changing. I, I just wonder it's, I mean, I'm not trying to be an ageist in the opposite way of when you were coming right. up, but it's like, <laughs> is an 80 year old, man, the best we got here. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? It's like, nobody's better at life when they're 80. You're not sharper. <laughs> you're not stronger. You're not a, a I, I, I guess you could be a good leader still, but it's like, come on. Yeah. Well, the, I, I know you, you were talking your, your father-in-law up in there. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, I know. And he's 84. I take him over Biden yeah. for sure. But, yeah. uh, but I, I think that's, I think the, the point is like, Regardless of whether you're talking about Biden, who's, you know, 80, who will be 80 plus years old by yeah. the time his term is over, or you're talking about another candidate who, you know, maybe in their fifties, we have the responsibility to look past the superficial and actually yeah. look at them as a person. Uh, and you know, what, what do they stand for? Right. Um, 
and and does what they stand for actually serve the interests of our country. Right. And I think and I think that's that's really the thing here is we look at a lot of the identity politics that the Democrats are playing. Mm-hmm. We look at the kinds of headlines that the media generates to try to distract that 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 are focused on the superficial. Yeah. Rather than um actually telling us the truth about, well, hey, here's what this person stands for. Here's what they would do or here's yeah. how they are positioning th- themselves on a particular issue of importance. Um, you know, through, through, for example, when we talked a lot about nuclear war in this conversation today, when I was, that was, that was the, one of the main issues that drove me to run for president in 2020 was in, um, in Hawaii about a, a, you know, even early 2018, we had a, a nuclear missile scare. It was a huge wake up call Mm -hmm. where early one morning, we all, you know, we all got a text message on our phone saying there's a ballistic missile inbound to Hawaii. Seek shelter, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Wow. And so as you might imagine, if you're thinking about God, well, what, what would we do right here, right now, if we got that message? Where do you go? You know, where can you take your family to be safe? Yeah. It says seek sh- uh, immediate shelter. Where is their shelter? And just as we sit here... People in Hawaii, all across the state, were trying to figure that out. And there was no shelter. There was no place to go. Figuring mm-hmm. out, okay, if you've got 15 minutes, 20 minutes left in your life, what do you do? Yeah. Where do you go? And and that was a huge wake-up call uh, for us there. It was a wake-up call in seeing how even in the aftermath of that, obviously that was you know a, a growing nuclear threat coming from North Korea. Mm-hmm how dismissive leaders in Washington were and continue to be once again, as we talked about, about the dangers and risks of nuclear war and how their policies are pushing us closer to that brink rather than recognizing as Reagan and JFK did, Hey, we need to walk back. Right. We need to exercise the courageous leadership to walk us back uh, from the brink. And so that, that was a huge driver for me to make that decision to run for president, to, to be that voice for peace, to be that commander in chief that would, have the courage to go and speak to other leaders of other countries, whether they be adversaries or not, Mm -hmm. towards that common interest of peace, just as JFK and Reagan did during their time. And so you would think, well, gosh, this should be an issue. The media should bring up to people who are asking to serve as commander in chief. This is a huge issue that has to do with the future of mankind. Yeah. Did they? No. Yeah. No, That's so I brought it up. There was a question. One of, they, they, they didn't bring it up. There was a question I brought that, that I think they said, what is the greatest threat facing the American people? And I, my answer was specifically related to nuclear war and talking about what I just shared. Mm-hmm. No follow-ups, no, Hey, let's talk to each candidate about how, what actions would you take right. to deescalate these tensions and to walk us back from the brink of nuclear disaster. It didn't happen. None of the candidates wanted to talk about it. Mm. The media didn't want to talk about it. They didn't think it was important. This was back in the 2020 campaign. And we look to where we are today and we're seeing the exact same thing. They don't think it's important. They don't want to think about or talk about the unthinkable. And so it begs the question, well, what hope is there for us in our leadership when they're refusing to, to... confront this most horrific reality yeah. that sits on our on our doorstep. Yeah, they're not they're not realistic either, I guess. I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I don't really know the answer to that, but I do like your take on it. I do like that hey, this needs to be addressed because yeah. I mean, what a crazy world. I mean, a nuclear weapon being fired hitting anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine it's a pretty scary thought. I mean, well, for me personally, I mean, even if people want to focus on the identity, identity politics, you check all the boxes, but more than that, you're a true leader, a leader that can be controlled, that will fight for the American people. That's God, that's, we need that more than anything. I mean, (laughs) I've said said it before. (laughs) Uh, I don't see, I don't know of a better candidate than you. Um, that's why it's an honor to sit across the table from you. I want to I want to thank you for coming to Oregon. Thank you. I want to thank you for doing the lift run shoot with me. And, that was a uh, blast. I, I um, It's no joke. 
too is definitely yeah. no joke. I was challenged today in oh. every respect. And um, yeah, I'll be thinking about you when I like can't lift my a glass of water <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow or for the you, next week. <laughs> you were strong. You were strong. Well, I want to end this with uh, this last oh, exercise man. here. And this is giving you your keep hammering uh, point. This is so awesome. You shot so well today. We're I gonna... learned so much. Oh. I learned so much. This was, um, yeah, I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to, <laughs> to learn more and uh, to be better and to do better. And so the next time I see you, what did we do? We did 53 yards today. 53, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're going to keep on increasing that. Or well, we're going to get that. To, you can go shoot with, was it Andre? I don't know. Yes, from, what is it, Privilege or what was Privileged bow hunter. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You can go shoot with him. He's right, he's right there near you. That's who I went and shot with oh, when I when I oh, did yeah, the yeah, yeah. out in Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. When I cool. did the yeah, he, he goes to the range there. We went to a nice, it's a nice range. We walked right by that, right? Uh, in the 50. I think it was dark, did we? so you probably didn't see it. Probably not. But uh it was right there along the coastline, right? Yeah, and there was there's different things you can do there, but one is an archery range uh -huh. and there's other activities they do, but yeah, it's a great place to shoot. Um, the privileged bow hunter, Andre, I'm sure would meet you there. Okay. He'd love to shoot with you. He's a great guy. He helped this set me up when I was there. And now you have your own bow and yeah. get it get it sent sent home with you. Thank you. All Thank right, you Tulsi. so much. Thank you very much. You're, this is awesome. You're such a badass. I wish <laughs> nothing you. but success for you. I know you're going to do your best for the American people. I will. All right. Thanks, Ken. Take, take care. Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my fuel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. Oh, oh. My fault. They want someone to blame. They sent the hate. It fuels my pace. I am Roy Tough. I am the change. The few endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes.